Um, my name again is um, Dr. Bola Jogunari. I'm the Group Executive Director for Panocean Oil Corporation and New Cross Group. Basically, we're an upstream energy company focused on developing energy resources in Nigeria. Um, in my role within the group, I sit um, in the corporate strategy unit where we focus basically on looking at the future of the organization and we ensure that we are a relevant entity in the future. Um, in addition to that, of course, I sit at the New Cross Group level overseeing the New Cross organization. Uh, we have a group, a, a group managing director, Mr. Stephen Fadeyu, who essentially is the one that gives the entire direction for the organization. Okay, fantastic. So let's get right into it. Um, let's get to overview of Nigeria's oil and gas sector. What's your view about your brief summary about, about Nigeria? Nigeria's energy sector? So, you know, when you look at Nigeria as a whole, I mean, at the energy sector, you're looking at a child a woman, a man that is about 56, 60 years old, who has gone through different challenges, different travels, but is still alive and is willing to improve. And that is the way I kind of think of Nigeria, that when I look at the current energy state of the country, I think we're not doing well for as long as we've had the energy sector going. You know, we've gone through different, different scenarios as a country, but one of the biggest stimulus that has happened recently is the passing of the Petroleum Industry Act. Mm -hmm. With that passing of that act, there are many areas within that act that is designed to, to stimulate investment into the energy sector of Nigeria. So I, I think we're definitely in the right direction with our overall energy trends. We have a long way to go, clearly, um, as expected, but I definitely the direction is what is encouraging for me the most. Okay, so speaking about a long way to go, um, so there are other countries around Africa, smaller countries, there's Namibia, there's Angola, and the conversations about FID, um, FDI, sorry, it's topical. Some have questioned in the time past, we used to attract 20 billion, now we are no longer seeing that kind of numbers. So, I mean, in your view, what are the two, three, four things we need to do to attract the right kind of FDI right. that would make Nigeria a more competitive oil and gas? Because we need to be, we, we are playing in a very competitive field. Right. We have other countries that are playing as well. So what are the things to attract FDI that can develop? I think the first thing to recognize is that Nigeria is a gold standard within Africa for leading the energy development. So everybody is going to be modeling after Nigeria and trying to do better than Nigeria. So it's always, you're always going to be that team that everybody wants to beat. But that doesn't mean you, re you relax. So what are the things that as a country we really should be focusing on? Some of them we're already doing. You know, some of the um, um, some of the incentives that the president just passed under the gas structure are things that would definitely encourage um, investment, both internally and externally. But when we're looking at FDI, you know, money is always going to go to where it is most welcome and where it is able to operate most transparently. So organizations are also going to be looking at the corporate governance around the industry at all, both at the macro level and at the micro level, which means they're also looking at the asset operators, they're looking at the asset owners, and they're looking at the governance around them. One thing which we have not had a very good rap about recently is security around our environment, which means a lot of organizations that want to invest directly in the country are worried about the high risk around security. But the government is taking a lot of steps to ad address that, some of which is around looking at alternative ways to move, um, I, to move oil around, around the industry. But also, most recently, we had the uh, head of NUPRC talk about improving the metering around the industry so that they can better meter the hydrocarbon as it's leaving a field and when it gets to where it is being fiscalized. I think sorting that security is definitely something very important. The next thing which I think is very important is the environment around which we operate. We need to ensure that this environment is one that is encouraging as much as possible. What do I mean by that? The process for approvals of field development or asset commercializations has to improve, and they're working on it. Basically, one of the things that the government has said is that, look, within a three-month period, within a two-month period, within a few weeks period, certain things must take place, certain approvals must take place. And they've also lowered the threshold for approvals at lower levels of the regulatory authorities or, or the or, um, NUIMS, the former NAPIMS. So with some of this, we're actually seeing a direction where we believe that with, um, with more investment, 
we, we, I mean, <laughs> we're going to see an environment where more FDI will be coming into the country. But we have to understand that FDI does not move immediately. People, when you make changes in your environment, people are going to study the consistency of it before they move money into that country. And I think that is the phase that people, are, investors are looking at, the consistency of leadership. When you compare us to countries like Angola, Mozambique most recently, even Sierra Leone, you're going to find that organizations find it easier to go into some of these environments. One, because they believe that they can have decisions very quickly and they can drive fiscal regimes that favor them rather than the country. But one of the things about the maturity of Nigerian energy industry is that the regulators and the leaders are very well exposed. So when FDI comes, it is tested to international standards that ensures that it provides service for the people in the country. Wow, fantastic. So in your earlier comment, you mentioned the, the executive orders. I mean, some would argue that a little bit too late. Um, some would say never too late. I mean, so what's your view about the executive orders? A step in the right direction or too late? It's never too late. You know, when we passed the Petroleum Industry Act and we worked on many versions of the Petroleum Industry Bill, everybody everywhere said it's too late, it's too late. There's already capital flight to Guyana. There's already capital flight to Mozambique. But there's still companies who are investing and taking incentives and advantages of the Petroleum Industry Act. This is the same way that I view the executive orders. Yes, people wish it happened five years ago. People wish it happened ten years ago. But it's happening now. And this is a time for us to be taking advantage of these opportunities that are driven. However, it needs patience. People have to understand that when an executive order comes out, there has to be an implementation of that executive order. There has to be reprogramming of people in, in specific positions to understand what the executive order means to what they're doing. And then based on that, Final investment decisions will be made by the energy companies who want to operate and take advantage of that. The energy industry, unfortunately, is not one that moves very quickly. We take our time, we do the right studies, we look at the fiscal regimes, and then we make those decisions. And when those decisions are eventually actually made, it can take you sometimes up to two years for you to see an action based on an executive order because the companies will take their time. But definitely, absolutely a step in the right direction. Okay, so I mean, another growing development in Nigeria is conversations around CNG. Um, I mean, I'm sure my colleague Faith will have a question on infrastructure, yeah. but I just want to get your view about the CNG. What's your view about Nigeria's approach to CNG, considering we are trying to build a sustainable future for us all? The use of energy, energy has to be used most efficiently and as cheaply as possible. One of the things that we do know about CNG, which is one of the distillates from the um, hydrocarbon process, is that it is definitely more cost efficient than gasoline that we use to power our vehicles right now. People have argued that it's at least 40% cheaper than using AGO that we currently, than gasoline that we currently use for our cars. So definitely, it's a way to reduce the demand on gasoline by using an alternative source of fueling. I mean, of course, there are steps that need to be taken to ensure that we deploy it appropriately and it has to be sustainable. So it's not just about talking about deploying CNG. We need to actually invest in the infrastructures that, supply, that support CNG, So, which means ease of availability. Literally, at the point, every gasoline station, every petrol station in Nigeria should have a CNG filling station. It should not be specific ones. Also, we need to ensure that people who can maintain the systems are also well trained. And because those are the things that help you to make it sustainable. These are the things that make it work well in places like India, where the, the average um, um, employee at a gasoline station knows how to utilize CNG. And that is why you find that with the way the government is rolling it out, they're not just talking about deploying CNG, they're look, looking at the entire value chain from the distillation from the gas plants to the distribution, the transportation, and then the utilization of it by vehicles. And also very, very important is the maintenance and servicing of the related equipment to it. But I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. And it also takes a lot of pressure off gasoline products, which is the primary one that we use to, to power our industries right now, our vehicles right now. How would you say your organization is playing a role in this transition? Right, right. So, so, so um, I think holistically, 
we play a very significant role in the gas transition, which I think is very, very important. Um, I mean, and I would highlight on some of this. When we look at Panocean, which is one of the companies within our group, we were one of those that first built a significant... When the original gas master plan in Nigeria did not work, we committed with NMPC to build the Ovade gas plant, which is a 200 million scoff gas plant in Ovade Delta State. And one of the objectives of this is not only was it the first project actually in sub-Saharan Africa to qualify for carbon credits, it has su successfully delivered gas with, to, um, to some of the gas distribution, uh, energy generating companies in Nigeria. In addition, through New Cross Petroleum, we actually are a partner with Platform Petroleum in the Agbaoma gas plant, which is a 30 million scoff gas plant that also produces LPG, butane, propane and condensate for the energy industry. But with CNG, actually, it's quite interesting because we're working on a project right now which we believe will put us into the CNG picture because already we supply gas to CNG producers, but we've seen how important it is for us to be part of that value chain. So we're currently working on a model where we can be part of the CNG generation business in Nigeria. Oh, great. Fantastic. So let's talk about oil and gas again. Yeah. Yeah. Nigeria's oil production is currently around 1.2, 1.3, and there's so much conversation about getting to 2.0. Um, I mean, people have said, oh, we need to speed up divestment. Some have said, oh, we need to fix coal oil types. Some have said, oh, we need to attract more investment, which are also mentioned in the as well. So, I mean, how can we get to 2.0 in Nigeria's oil production? You know, the race to 2.0 feels like it's a high-speed 100-meter race. And when you go this fast, sometimes you cannot sustain yourself over a long distance. Um, one of the metaphors I like to think about is, for our current energy needs, the prior generation should have invested in it. And what we are doing now, we need to adopt the mentality that our investment today is for the next generation. If we adopt that mentality, then we can understand that we can sustainably focus on a season of growth, a season of sowing. What cannot happen is you cannot sow and reap at the same time. And I think that is why when I look at our, our aim for, we're aiming for two million barrels a day, we need to be systematic about it. What are the things that take us there? Do we have the right incentives in terms of incentives to encourage exploration? Because as of today, Production, is, production, as in production potential for many companies, is only hindered by evacuation. What we really need is bake a bigger pie. And to bake that bigger pie, we need to do more exploration. For exploration to take place, there, most companies need those incentives for you to do true exploration because, as we know, they're very high risk. You can do an exploration well and find nothing and have spent over $50 million. So incentives need to be, significant incentives need to be in place to encourage that exploration period. Then once we're able to mature the exploration, we can focus on maturing those prospects and producing them. And that is why it's really very important that the race to two million barrels has to be very methodical, it has to be very cerebral, and it has to be executed by project managers that have, that have a long-term focus. Um, it would be great if we can get to 2.2 million barrels as soon as possible, but I think it's more important that we develop the resources appropriately so that it's easy to achieve 2.5 million barrels and even 3 million barrels if we do that investment today and have a long-term view on it. Oh, great, fantastic. So, I mean, there's also conversation on gas. Um, do you think gas can play a bigger role in Nigeria's economy than we currently Well. It definitely can, and I think it already is. Um, one of the big, biggest stimulus for industrialization is gas. When you think about it, because we really need our industries to operate in Nigeria, and a lot of them need that high level of gas commitment for them to operate. As of today, the deployment of gas as an energy source for the industrial sector is very minimal. It's very minimal. It's growing. It's a growing trend that we're seeing, but it's still very minimal. And that is why we really need to refocus on the energy needs of our industries and power it with a gas revolution. Once we focus on this, then we can actually drive and better deploy gas. As of today, if you take a look at it, most people that think about gas is mostly energy generation, and they're using it 
a lot of people think about it for their homes and for other sources. But really, when you look at our industries, our manufacturing sector is heavily challenged by energy. And that energy can be most easily be met by gas. So one of the things which I've always advocated is, let's focus on CNG for the automobile industries and take the pressure off gas. And then we can, we can, then we can use lean gas to power industries for power. Mm, you know? So if we kind of have this mindset, we can actually better use our gas as a country. I mean, if you look at the demand even for LNG in the country, it's, it's, it's quite high. A lot of people are looking at these projects. This tells you that gas has a bigger role to play in the country. The challenge is gas actually has a longer FID um, developing process than oil. With oil, you can develop an oil field very quickly and start, for lack of a better word, flaring the gas, which we discourage. But with gas, you actually need to set up an entire gas plant, which is a lot more financial involvement, and it takes a lot more time. But when there's commitment and intention, we can definitely execute it and become a significant gas-powered nation. Yeah, so talking about financing, which you also mentioned now, financing seems to be a big deal, which oil and gas is a very capital-intensive right. um, sector. You need lots of money, you need to be patient. So, I mean, how can we... Can we make funds available, more investment opportunities for operators like you right. to increase exploration, which would also allow to that speed. Right. So we're able to wrap up exploration, right. sure we can do two point zero. But then we need financing as well. So how can we get that financing? Uh, it, it's, it's a great question and it's one that I think can really transform our industry. One of the things, I remember when we sat down around 2019 and we talked about the need for an Afrocentric financial institution that understands the needs of Africa, that is going to put the right criteria in place from an African point of view to fund and incentivize the development of our industry. The recent announcement by, uh, by, the, I, uh, by the African Petroleum Organization and Afrexim is definitely a big jump in the right direction. While it's not going to be available for everybody, you're going to see an opportunity for potentially an Afrocentric bank mm -hmm. that will be based out of Abuja mm -hmm. that will be looking at impactful projects that can help to develop energy for Africa as a whole. I mean, when we look at Africa, I mean, it's, I'm sure you've seen pictures of what the night looks like in Africa, and you just see darkness all over Africa. It is still sad that despite the amount of resources that we have as a continent, our energy deployment and energy utilization is still this low. And I think little steps like this will definitely help to drive um, um, the further development of energy resources. And I say energy resources because it's not just about oil and gas that we're talking about. We're also talking about non-fossil fuel options, renewable options as well. You know, one of the things that I'm not a big advocate of is in the drive to say that we're looking at non-fossil fuel, we're looking at solar as a form of energy, we're importing 99% of the materials into Africa. That is not sustainable and is a big drain on the foreign reserves of any of the African countries. We need to ensure that the manufacturing of the components of the non-fossil fuel energy components is actually taking place in Africa. People have talked about, oh, the cost of producing them in Africa cannot compete with the cost of producing them in anywhere else in the world. So let's bring those who have helped to develop it in other parts of the world to come and help us develop it and give them the incentives. You know, I always use the, the example sometimes of the iPhone. When Apple initially wanted to go into China, because of cheaper labor, it went in there thinking that, okay, eventually I'm going to get very cheap labor and I'm going to be able to produce my produce there. But what has Apple done? It has helped to industrialize the development of microchips, conductors, and all components of the iPhone in China so that China can literally produce a phone that can compete with an iPhone. And this is ultimately the view that we also have to have, that we need to be intentional in making sure that we're not just a raw material producer, but we're actually a producer of infrastructures that help to develop the alternative energy market. So yes, um, I think and, um, financing is going to be a key role in terms of developing our energy, but of course, governance, people have to see more transparency, people have to see more leadership. There are a lot of qualities that help finance have trust where it's going to put that money. Yeah, exactly. So um, we'll talk about human capital now, and um, the Japan wave is affecting almost every sector of the economy. Right. Now, the oil and gas is an extremely, I mean, 
the very skilled sector. You need to know what you are doing to be in the sector. Right. Right. You know? So, I mean, how can we maintain a certain level of excellence in terms of retaining and training the human capital we need right. to achieve it? What zero you talk about? You know, you know, it, it's um, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night when I really think about it that where are the next generations of people who are going to lead the energy sector going to come to? Are they going to be able to develop this? And the truth is when we look at the quality of some of the people that are coming out of institutions today, they are not at the level that they need to be to go into organizations. And it is a failure of many organizations, including organizations like us. Some of the things which I've talked about is let us actually intentionally develop programs that help to train institutions. For example, let organizations that are, um, for example, energy companies that are successful have direct tax breaks for helping to fund university institution curriculums. Let us help, because it has to be, it has to start at the university level. It has to start at the secondary school level. It has to start at the primary school level, where we start reinvesting in our educational infrastructure. And one, so those are some of the things that I've encouraged that. Let there be clarity in encouraging things like that. If you remember during the last regime, there was a time when the government tried to say, we're going to hire a, a lot of students under the Ministry of Labor, and we'll give them employment for three months. The program was not sustainable, because the government is not in the business of hiring people. What the government, what we should be looking at doing is saying, company A, company B, look, we're going to give you this tax break. But in exchange for this tax break, we expect you to hire 50 Nigerians. We expect you to train 20 Nigerians. We expect you to provide scholarship for 15 Nigerians. You know, and with this, yes, you're not guaranteed that they will all stay in Nigeria, but at least it helps to improve the quality of people in Nigeria. And then the employment is created in our environment. We cannot make jobs without incentivizing it. Organizations are struggling to even keep the manpower they have. So literally, most organizations are looking to lay off Nigerians. So we really need to get to the root bottom of it and say, look, what do we need to do for you to hire 10% more of the people that you're hiring today? And that is going to be built around incentivizing these organizations to be successful in hiring them. Yeah. This is one solution that I think, it doesn't just work for the oil industry, but it works for the entire youth of Nigeria. I mean. When you look at the number of unemployed Nigerians today, it's scary. And I think it's an, the onus is on all of us to find a solution for it. We cannot allow everybody to jackba and the best of people leave. What will happen is the best of our country will go somewhere else and will be involved in leadership in those countries. And then we would have those who are not successful in leaving, leading us as a country. Okay, so a final question from me before my colleague would also ask a question. With this conversation around what IOCs are leading, and then there are questions about do we have the local guys and the local guys competent enough to take over from the IOCs when after they've left or after they've divested their business? Right. And I've, I've strongly believed that yes, we have enough manpower, but then I mean, it's better to hear from the IOC mouse. What's your view? Do you think the local guys are well skilled and they have the, well, they have the right attitude and the right and mindset to develop? The assets that the IOCs will be from. No, every time this question comes up, I always tell people that within the IOCs, majority of those that work within the IOCs are Nigerians. So when even though you can call them Shell, you can call them Chevron, over 90% of the employees that work in this organization are Nigerians. They've been trained and they've worked here. So the only things that majority of them are looking for are the opportunities to survive. And this is a trend that you have seen within some of those that have successfully acquired assets from the IOCs. While not everyone has been successful, we see successful trends about some of the, some of the indigenous companies that are really growing very strongly and taking over some of these assets. Um, for those that we're not seeing succeed, there are a few things that challenge everyone, including the IOCs. Do not forget that the IOCs left onshore Nigeria, predominantly went offshore, and then some of them have, ever, have left Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But it is a macro challenge, both um, socioeconomic socio and political, that have challenged some of the com companies. And the Nigerian companies have the same challenges. You know, uh, bunkering is still there. Mm -hmm. 
and to different varies, you know, illegal bunkering, I mean, you know, it's still there to different extents. Uh, you still have the challenges with some of the communities that we have as well. We have um, interfaces with the regulators, which I challenge. But I think overall, one thing I always say is as some companies are leaving Nigeria, others are looking at Nigeria as an opportunity. IOCs are divesting, and there's a lot of conversations about do the local operators have enough skill, do they have the manpower, do they have the finance, do they have the technology, do they have the skill to be able to take on this challenge. So how would you respond to these questions about local operators? Right. So, you know, one of the things I always tell people is when you look at the IOCs, the international oil companies that we look at, we reference, majority of those that work in these organizations are Nigerians. Whether they're working for the companies in Nigeria or they've posted them outside Nigeria, majority are Nigerians, which means they definitely have the knowledge, they have the know-how to definitely lead the transition of moving the assets from international operators to, um, um, to independent operators within Nigeria. The challenge that most indigenous operators have, of course, is probably with financing, because with the IOCs, they're able to leverage their international exposure and raise a lot of funding to develop their assets, unlike the indigenous companies here, the independent indigenous companies, who majority of us leverage on the banks that we have in Nigeria to fund us, or maybe a few high net worth individuals that fund you, but real, and which is not really by itself sustainable. And then the other challenge which we have, of course, is the ability to manage the challenges around the environment, like things around the areas of illegal bunkering, which still exists and is probably part of what has challenged the international oil companies from moving from onshore to deep offshore or offshore operations. But I think Nigerians as a whole have exhibited a lot of competence. We have a bunch of references of very successful independent Nigerian operators that are running assets well. Of course, just like IOCs, I always say there are IOCs that are unsuccessful. Same way we have Nigerian operators that are unsuccessful. But, but I think overall, the independent Nigerian operators are doing very well considering the challenges of the environment. Um, you mentioned independent regulators now. So would you say the regulations being put in place are constraining your activities in Panocean and New Cross? How would you say these regulations have affected your activities or improved your activities? Right, right, right. I think, I mean, when we look at the regulations that are in place, whether as a function of the Petroleum Industry Act or otherwise, I like to look at it from an uh, industry-wide perspective. And I think when I, when, I, when I consider the regulations that are in place, they're actually business enabling now. I mean, if you look at the Petroleum Industry Act, the way it was passed, it, it brings the regulator, which is NUPRC for the upstream sector, it brings you very much closer to the operator and allows them to actually work closer with you. So I think overall, to be quite candid, the, the, the regulators are doing a great job. I mean, recently there was a conversation where the regulator, and I, I hope I'm not going to a controversial area here, where the regulator was drawn into a conversation about making crude oil available for an independently owned refinery. And people brought up the question about, should the regulator force oil producers to sell to an independently operated refinery? And the regulator said, what we are bound to do is make crude oil available. But it has to be on the terms of a willing buyer, willing seller, which means the pricing index has to be just as it is as a global market. For as long as that, our job is to provide that enabling environment. And I think it was very correct that, you know, as an industry, we need to ensure that there's sanctity of the industry and, there's pro and, the, and all the organizations can sustain themselves. So, I think the regulators right now are actually doing a great job. I mean, some of the biggest challenges that people have had when you all look at the opposite side is for the, those assets that have gone into transaction mode where there has been a commercial arrangement already finalized and you're waiting for an approval from the regulator or the presidency. And we have examples of some of those that were delayed. Those are clear examples of where you can say, oh, there were challenges, what led to this, there's been capital flight everywhere else. But thank God, recently the president stepped in and he ensured that even some of the things that were holding up some of these transactions, they were approved by the president, those transactions are proceeding. So sometimes it's nice that the executive steps in and guides the regulator to make firm decisions very quickly. Okay.
Okay, so let's talk about Partnership then. What's the big things you guys are working on? What's the output like for Partnership? Do you, where do you think Partnership will be in the next three or four five years? You know, when organizations look at, when I get questions like this, where do you think you'll be in three, four, five years? A lot of people want to hear production targets. They want to hear where you're going. But I think for, for us, I mean, and I'll talk about that, but some of the things that are very exciting that we're doing is trying to actually develop the manpower of our organization. What am I talking about? We've recently looked at our people and working on the culture around the environment and improving the culture in the, within the environment. We looked at improving the workplace environment and how to make our team members who are staff happy to come to work. So those are some of the key steps we're doing. But interestingly, we're also adopting things which are very interesting. As you know, technology is really very important for the future. Recently, we started what we call a a, a radar unit, which is a research and data analytics unit. And the objective of this is for us to be a more data-guided organization, such that as we grow our organization, we're looking at data to help us make decisions, both in terms of where we drill, how we drill, how we intervene, what projects we get involved with. But holistically, one of the things which we're looking at as an energy company is to be a fully present energy company, not just an oil producing company. When I look at both Panocean and New Cross, not just an oil company, but also a gas company. So recently, we also created a unit that we look at gas as a business. The objective of this unit is primarily to look at gas and how we maximize the value of our gas. They don't care about the oil potential of the company. They're just looking purely at the gas. And I think this is one that's going to be very, very successful. In addition, we started another unit that is called New X Energy Resources. New X is a non-fossil fuel part of our business that looks at non-fossil fuel energy sources as an opportunity. So I think over the next few years, clearly we have very high set targets to increase our oil production. I mean, when we look across the group right now, we're somewhere between 30, 40,000 barrels a day. We have plans in place to significantly improve this within the next, this is for oil, and also for gas, and, and, and for our gas, we're hovering close to 100 million scope within the group. But we're looking to significantly increase this number, not just by the end of this year, but we have a three-year plan to significantly increase both our oil and our gas production. But it's not just that. We're also investing in infrastructure. So as you may be aware, the Amukpa Escravos project, which is a pipeline that grows from Sapele to Escravos, was developed by NMPC and Panocean. We're looking at maximizing the utilization of this pipeline as an alternative to the Transfer Cados line as well. So um, quite a lot of things that we're doing within the organization that you'll see come out over the next few years. But I think more importantly for me is improving the what I would call the happiness of people coming to work. Definitely want to be known for that. We don't just want to talk about it. You know, a lot of people say our people are our greatest assets. We want to actually demonstrate it by the actions we do in the organization rather than just talking about it. For more in-depth analysis, please read up on our website at www.